damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing Dan Gifford. He is an investigative reporter, uh, formerly uh, did TV news reporting, and uh, is a documentary filmmaker. And he was the producer of the great documentary Waco, The Rules of Engagement, that came out in uh, 1997, if I remember correctly. Welcome to the show. Dan, how are you, sir? Thank you. A little, uh, little frog in the throat from the weather out here in California of late. But yeah, plenty of smoke to breathe lighting. out there, huh? Uh, there's yeah. a new documentary and a new miniseries about the Waco massacre coming out, correct? Uh, that's what I'm told. I must tell you, I rarely, I used to walk, work for a <clears throat> network television like KTRK Channel 13 in Houston. and uh, But I just, we now have so many channels and, and so much of the stuff that I see on, uh, it, it, it competes. I just rarely watch network uh, television anymore, and that's why I didn't even know these things were coming up, uh, like the one that's on ABC that I wrote about. So uh, when I uh, heard about it and then watched it, I that's what got the reaction. Because it's uh, people will write, they're, they're, it's, it's very salacious, it's very a lot of inflammatory stuff that uh, is uh, just made for, uh, for television, and uh, it's not true. That's the problem, that so much of what you see that uh, has been done uh, is just not off is off the fact. Yeah. All right. Now, so uh, for people who aren't familiar, uh, this movie Waco: The Rules of Engagement is really what um, you know, I guess, kicked the door in, so to speak, on uh, kicked it open on getting this story out, and getting regular Americans who had been lied to up until that time and believed the mass suicide lies and all the rest of the lies about uh, the Branch Davidian group there in Waco. Uh, and, and really began to change things. So maybe can you talk to us a little bit about how you guys got into this story in the first place, you and Mike McNulty and whoever else? Yeah. Well, what happened was I was uh, at CNN in New York and left CNN and basically switched over to acting in New York. And uh, some of the people who have long memories might remember me in Saturday Night Live as a uh, featured extra and a few things like that. And I moved out here with my wife to uh, the West Coast. And we were looking for a project for a... Uh, for a production company that we just started, and I ran into Mike McNulty. And he had this wild story about, uh, you know, what happened at uh, Waco. This would be like 1995 or, no, I guess, no, this was earlier. This is like 1994, I suppose. And I thought it was all crazy, and we just thought it would make a nice one-hour or half-hour TV little segment about uh, conspiracy theories, and I thought the entire official story was true. I, mean, I really hadn't paid that much attention to the thing when it went on, but it was, if those remember it was on every day all day for what 51 some days and uh then we got into it and found out that the official story is not true i mean 99 percent of it and really what matters and this is uh people have taken their eye off the ball in here this is the nexus the uh of what uh is going on in the country that I hate to use the term is turning us into a police state, but it is. This is where you have the uh, the federal government, not that this hasn't been done before and police don't do it anymore, lying to get a cert- a warrant. And they're uh, putting all sorts of salacious stuff that inflames going out and shooting and uh, kicking in doors. It's, uh, as you say, and, and the bottom line here is that uh, if you want to know what uh, uh, where your civil liberties are threatened, and uh, this is it. It's uh, even to the point of when the prosecution, the, the government prosecuted the Davidians, 
they did something that prosecutors are doing all over almost every day, which is they're withholding exculpatory evidence showing that the people they're prosecuting did not commit the crimes that they committed. Mm-hmm. And that happened here. You had Bill Johnston, who was the uh, assistant to U.S. attorney who prosecuted the Davidians. Then afterwards, Mike McNulty kept on with this stuff and managed to get into the evidence locker and found that a lot of the things that uh, were withheld from the defense attorneys and that Johnson didn't know. So when Johnson complains about it, the government turns around and prosecutes him for obstruction of justice and then prosecute, tries to get him disbarred. So you have the government prosecuting a prosecutor that prosecuted the Davidians because of what the government did withholding evidence. And this is not an isolated story at all by any means. Yeah. And well, you know, I'm so glad that you frame it that way because – You know, I mean, this is what I thought at the time, and I think it's really played out, right? That the American people's ratification of the Clinton government's actions at Waco, that was really, you know, it was the litmus test. Not that it was necessarily meant to be, but if the American people will tolerate what they did to the Branch Davidians, then how do you think we feel about kicking in black stores in the middle of the night over a joint in their ashtray or whatever? Because let's face it, when there's 50,000 SWAT raids a year... And it's not in my neighborhood. Almost all of that is happening in poor black people's neighborhoods, which is why they're so pissed off. But it's the militarization and the military, uh, you know, the the special forces training of these SWAT teams Mm -hmm. and all their equipment. And as you say, all the precedents, the way that they operate in terms of withholding evidence and all these other things. The American people loved it back then. You know, you mentioned it went on for 51 days and we all watched it for 51 days. Well, that's why they had to kill him. Because the housewives of Texas, I don't know about the rest of America, but the housewives of Texas wanted them dead, dead, dead because they wanted to get back to watching One Life to Live. And they couldn't stand it oh. anymore. Is that still on the air? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I was sacking groceries at the time, and every upper middle class white lady from Northwest Austin would get up with just, this was the talk of the neighborhood. It's all anybody had to talk about. Well, he said he was Jesus, and I say they just go in there and kill him. Like, yeah, maybe we yeah. should yeah. nail him to a tree, huh? Is that what you think we should do? Yeah, see that's that's and that's the attitude, and I but I think it's really to the the forewoman of the jury on the division said it. To, now she took an opposite view. She said the people who should have been charged with crimes are the federal agents. And the Davidians are lucky that survived that they this whole event happened in Texas because in Texas it's one of the few states, maybe the only remaining one, where you can use deadly force against law enforcement officers, and that's an interesting phrase I'll get to in a second, but, uh, and this is, fits the, the, the circumstance where what do you do when the police show up at your door and they just start shooting, and it's very plain they intend to kill you? Do you have an obligation to be a good citizen and let them kill you, or do you have a right to defend your life? Now, if you saw the film and the Davidians called 911. The sheriffs, they didn't know what was going on. They were part of this. This was a big public relations event that the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms had planned. And what they wanted was was they were going to have a lot of people in handcuffs and a lot of guns and a lot of TV cameras, which they had alerted to be out there. And it was going to be a big uh uh, spur to get more gun control because that's what the Clinton administration had talked about, which was coming in. And when you are the bureau, it uh, means more power, more money, more personnel, all that. And the truth is, almost every agency I have seen at federal, state, local level before their budget comes up will de- do some kind of a public relations scam like this to justify more money, more power, more personnel, see how important we hey, it are. It was called Operation Showtime. That's right. It was. It was. And that's exactly what uh, what went on. Yeah. And, you, and you know. honestly, you know, and I'm sorry because I always interrupt every every Waco interview. I end up talking about this. But I think this is the most important thing because I, I try not to be a collectivist and say things like we and this and that when I'm really speaking about other people, not myself and not necessarily you and whatever. But it was the consensus among the people. And, it, you know, because TV said so. And the cops say so. And so the American people went along with that. But, I mean, I saw them with my own eyes. The, the yeah. upper middle class housewives of Northwest Austin, who otherwise would never hurt a fly, were saying they ought to mm-hmm. go in there and end it. End it. Because it was yeah. interrupting their TV shows. And it didn't matter that it was a house full of women and children. It didn't matter. 
What mattered uh, was they were sick and tired of it, and it was perfectly fine for the government to murder all those people. That was the consensus before the tank raid. That was really the mandate for the tank raid. Really did come from the people, or at least, I mean, it came originally from TV and the cops, but the people bought it, hook, line, and sinker, the same way they did against Saddam Hussein, same way they do against Iran today. You know, whatever you say, government... Yeah, and, and the FBI has built this, this uh, public image over the years. Uh, they, people old enough will think of Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. or Jimmy Stewart or something to sort the straight arrow, never would lie. But it's, it's, uh, uh, that's just not, not the fact when you're talking about an agency that has this kind of power. And a lot of it was exerted on me. I mean, the, uh, the, the people you might have seen reference in what I wrote there about I received a subpoena from the Danforth Committee to talk, and what they really want to know is who my sources were, and I never divulged that. And I told them, uh, okay, I'll talk to you, but I want you to stop the harassment that's going on. When I go to the coffee shop, people show up and sit down at the table, and they've read my emails. They've listened to my phone calls. They make threats. They one that one even said, uh, you know, Dan, uh, uh, we know where you drive. You know, you might get stopped on the road by somebody who looks like a policeman. It might not actually be a policeman. And this, uh, interestingly enough, goes back to when I was a reporter in Houston and I was doing uh, bank fraud stories. That you might remember the 1980s, we had a lot of looting going on, and the looters could go over to Arkansas under the Clinton administration. This is long before they were on the national scene, and give part of their loot to the Bubba group, and uh, they were protected from, you know, administratively from a lot of investigations. And we had people, my camera crew and our KTRK, stopped on the road in Texas by Texas uh, sheriff's people who knew who we were, and they were just sending us a message. We know who you are. Uh, just we're just uh, you know, watch yourself. It's this kind of intimidation. And that might right sound there. crazy to people, but I don't doubt it in this case. Yeah. You know, for and real. Then, and, and I had, uh, oh, you know, honey traps. I mean, uh, there were two honey traps that were out here. That, 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 for those who don't know, that's when a good-looking woman you know, shows up and uh, tries to seduce you into a relationship and then uses for blackmail. But that's... Uh, Lots and lots of things. And I have had freedom of information requests in probably longer than Susan Atkinson, the CBS reporter, has, uh, asking for my file from the FBI. All I got back was a snarky note that, well, we don't keep, you know, we don't keep records on everybody. Baloney. Of course they do. And it's, well, in this case, they were maybe not everybody, but they certainly have them on me, but they're not going to get them. And the whole thing is stonewalled. And the and the evidence has been destroyed. You know, it's uh, it, it, this is really you want a conspiracy. This is uh, this is it. And it's again, this is not unusual. This happens all over the country every day. You just had the one out. What was the guy? Clyde Bundy, the guy out in Oregon, or uh, was it who was uh, in, in the land? Yeah, out in Nevada. Yeah, and you know, yeah. this is a big story. I'm going to see if I can get Jim Bovard on about this. But the judge dismissed all the charges, quote, with prejudice. Because of yeah. the amount of covering up and withholding of evidence from the defense and lying about things like ringing this ranch with snipers and being out to get this guy, and all their documents proved it. Yeah. By the way, say hello to Jim Bovard. We can talk to him. Good buddy. Yeah, uh, I will. Yeah, he's I great. A, great. But I have a story too. posted on the, on the past, the post here that I use. It's uh, Conviction, the decade's most important uh, film. This Hillary Swank did this story, and it's a real story of a guy who was convicted of a murder he didn't commit in Massachusetts, and nobody would take the case, and so his own sister had to go to law school and become a lawyer to defend him, and it turns out the police intimidated witnesses into into this, uh, giving uh, evidence against him for something that he didn't do, and this that's just the short story of it, but again, this is uh, not unusual. We have Right. You know, the story, let me let me break in here real quick, too. There's the story of the kid uh, Browder. There's a documentary about it now. Um, the kid who was accused of stealing a backpack in New York, and they kept him in Rikers for years with, and then finally ended up just dropping the charges, and he killed himself uh, later mm-hmm. on. And it turned out that the kid that had ratted on him was a kid that the police basically just used as a slave, who just they just blackmailed and extorted him into pointing the finger at all kinds of innocent people in that neighborhood for years, and they got away with it. 
You know, well, it's, the, the, the police are under a, a lot of pressure, and, this, and I can understand what happens if you're a cop and you're on a case, and a case has, let's say, a murder case that has uh, it's getting publicity. You're under pressure to arrest somebody, and if you're a prosecutor, you're under pressure to prosecute to get a conviction, and so it's winning at all costs. And that is one of the problems here. I'll, I'll just point to one of the great examples that most people have never heard about where the district attorney did the right thing. Uh, Homer Cummings was the U.S. attorney under FDR in the 1930s. But prior to that, he was the district attorney in a small town of Connecticut. Anyway, they had a murder there that everybody was upset about. I mean, to the point they wanted to, an arrest was made. And it, it looked very obvious that this guy had to be the murderer. And Homer Cummings went out and investigated the people that uh, were making the claims and the witnesses and all that and found it was impossible. This guy could not have done it. So in court, he disproved his own murder case. And he got a lot of flack for it, but he said, hey, my job as district attorney is to do justice. It ain't just to get a conviction. And that's the, that's the standard we need to return to. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing, right? We all... Uh, watch Perry Mason or, or uh, Matlock or whatever when we're kids, and or even, I guess, Law and Order nowadays, right, where if they're wrong, they're always the first to admit it. You know, as soon as Matlock gets the confession on the stand, the prosecutor says, well, God dang, Judge, I guess <laughs> I have to admit I've made a mistake here. Please dismiss the charges, right? But that's not real life at all. That's just TV, but that's the way we always assume that it goes. Anyway, wait. So let's talk about the Branch Davidians because there's we can sit here and complain about the cops in general forever, but and the courts and the rest of it. Well, but, just one, way, one, sure. one thing is you just use the phrase "law and order." Now that phrase didn't exist prior to about we didn't use that for police prior to about nineteen sometime in the sixties, not late sixties, uh, and that's one of the problems with the language that has been altered so that we that has a harder edge for than say peace officer or policeman or some words that we used to use. That one originated on the uh, series uh, Adam 12. Right. If you yeah, I mean, enforcement actually has the violent verb right in it, right? Precisely. And that's one of the things we are all manipulated by the language that uh, has been concocted that we use every day, just like with the Davidians. They lived in a compound. No, they didn't. That, that's a, that is a specifically crafted psychological warfare word to militarize the situation. What's the difference between a gun collection? I, in Texas, a lot of people have gun collections. Or do they have an arsenal? Or are they stockpiling weapons? You know, it's, you know it's how you want to phrase this. Hey, y'all, here's how to support the show. First of all, check out my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. It's at foolserrand.us. Also, check it out. The YouTube project is really uh, going well. We're now up to... Um, 1100, 1200, something of them. That's youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Uh, sign up for the podcast feeds at scotthorton.org and check out scotthorton.org slash donate. Anybody who donates $20 gets to the front of the list to get the audio book and it's really coming soon. My, I'm done. My audio mastering dude has it now and it's going to be soon. So uh, $20 gets you to the front of the list for that. Uh, a donation of $50 to scotthorton.org slash donate gets you a signed copy of the book. $100 gets you a QR code, commodity disc, no face value. You scan it with your phone, and it tells you the instant spot price in real time. It's the most brilliant invention ever. And uh, for a donation of $200 or more to the Scott Horton Show, you get a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think Libertarian Audiobooks at listenandthink.com. And uh, they're the ones putting out my book, my audio book, too. Um, and I take all kinds of cryptocurrencies. If you want to donate them, I'll accept them. All that's at scotthorton.org slash donate. Shop amazon.com by way of my link. Leave me good reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, and Amazon if you read the book. And, um, yeah, you know, invite me to give a speech to your group. Thank you for bringing up the guns, because here's where I want to get to the, when we start, you know, get to the story here, really. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Paul Fata, or Fatah, or however you pronounce it, left mm -hmm. the Branch Davidian's property that morning, driving a dually pickup truck with a camper shell and towing a U-Haul trailer, both full of rifles. 90-plus percent of the Branch Davidian's arsenal. 
And he drove it out of there, and it wasn't because he was evading the incoming ATF raid. It was because mm-hmm. he was going to the gun show in Austin at the old Best building there on Sheridan and 290, and he was going to sell them because he was the guy that ran the Davidians' gun business. And that was 90-something percent of their guns. And then when he found out about the raid later that day, he called them and said, well, I'm the guy with all the guns. Are you looking for me? I'll turn myself in. I don't want any trouble, mister. And, yeah, that, that was the, the Branch Davidians' arsenal. As, and they portrayed it as though these people were about to, I guess, march on downtown Waco and take it over. Well, that's what a lot of people thought. Is see, this, you know, that's the thing, two things here that's never mentioned. One is they had a legal business. But all the talk about gun control caused the increase in price in certain firearms. So they bought them from a, a dealer and held them until the price went up and then sold them back to other dealers or whatever. Perfectly legal. We couldn't find anything illegal about firearms. And I say that, uh, contrary to what uh, ATF reps have said, you're talking about an agency where agents have bragged, in my presence, they can take any semi-automatic firearm and take it into their lab and goof around with it and cause it to fire two shots with one pull of the trigger, and that qualifies as a machine gun, and then they can arrest the possessor. And they've done that, and they've bragged about this. Uh, I've heard this over the years, and so have uh, other uh, cops out here. But that is something that is just never mentioned. But we have never found anything that's uh, credible, I should say, is that, that they were had illegal firearms. And by God, it's Texas. How many people have... It means machine guns are legal in, in Texas if you get the right stuff from the sheriff. Uh, so it's uh, that, that's one that uh, inflames when people hear that. And it's, again, an untruth. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, sorry, again, another little sort of personal story here for a second. Kind of the reason why I'm like this overall and stuck this way. Um, anti-government extremist that I am is because of Waco, but it's also the origin of my obsession with talk radio too, because the first time I ever heard AM talk radio when I was 16 uh, driving my sister's hand-me-down old Plymouth, I decided, oh, I wonder what's on the AM band in Austin, Texas. I actually have no idea. I've lived here my whole life. And I started flipping through the AM band, and there was surviving Branch Davidians telling their side of the story and taking calls. And the callers yeah. knew all kinds of stuff about it. And the Branch of yeah. like, yeah, that's right, exactly. And my mind was just absolutely blown. Because here was, it's like Rumsfeld says about the unknown unknown. It had never occurred to me that you could... That anyone could ever hear the Branch Davidian side of the story, that they even had one to tell. You know, rather Jennings and Brokaw sure as hell weren't going to hand it to me on a silver platter. And, mm-hmm. and here, callers can call in and can ask questions and make good points, and it's this whole other level of discussion of the truth about this most important thing that had been so covered up and lied about. And it's just, it's a miracle. I love it. Uh, it's the technology of, of, of this medium... And, and what it's good for. Interviews like this. You know, I know that there are people listening to this who are way too young to know anything about Waco at all, who are now going to watch the Rules of Engagement and then hopefully McNulty's sequels, A New Revelation, and The Fleer Project as well. Um, well if if you know, nobody comes away with any one thing from this interview, it is we don't talk to police, and particularly federal police, without your lawyer present. And you see this playing out right now where, let's say, an FBI agent or two could talk to you, have talked to you a year ago, and then they come back now, and maybe you don't recollect what exactly you said. Now they can charge you with lying to an FBI agent. And now you're really in the suit. You're going to hire a lawyer. You're going to go to federal court. It's, it's, going, to break, it's going to break the bank. And they know that, and they can use that as leverage to, uh, for, for whatever. That is one of the things that people have got to understand is you don't talk to police without a lawyer. Yeah. All right, now, so get to the heart of this thing about uh, David Koresh. You talked about how it was a PR stunt, but, you know, this guy, I don't buy at all that this was like a Charles Manson cult, and I think you guys dispel that in the, or Jim Jones style call. I think you dispel that pretty well in the documentaries. And yet he did have a bit of a cult of personality there. And uh, geez, he had a mullet and a Trans Am and people just hate that. So, I mean, just tell me exactly how horrible was this guy? How criminal was this little commune religious group that he was running out there? And just how bad did they, did they deserve to be raided and then later shot and burned? Well, first of all, what is the difference between a cult and a religious sect? 
Before Charles Manson, cult just meant a small religion. Jesus and his followers were a cult. And when Manson happened, uh, we really didn't know what do you call that. And that's when cult became vilified. Now, the pro- this is the, one of the most telling things that goes to your housewives you were talking about earlier, is that when you listen to the negotiations between the FBI guys and the Davidians, a lot of this is theological stuff, the, uh, the arguments. The FBI guys are born-again Christians or some other sect or Mormons, and they're arguing their theology against uh, the branch Davidians, which is Seventh-day Adventist. I mean, they are, they are a break-off back in the 1920s or somewhere back in there of the Seventh Adventist uh, Church. So they're having theological arguments. So that you might have a, you just think about the Thirty Years' War, where you got you know, Catholics and Lutherans all at each other's throats, and um, you know you cross yourself one way, and somebody else crosses there, so I can kill you because uh, you crossed the wrong way. But I the the, the stuff about the. Uh, the religion and all the things about the, the, the sex and all that is to this is totally irrelevant because that is completely outside the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and yet they use that to inflame. You also had in Waco uh, a dynamic with the local newspaper getting uh, running uh, very inflammatory stories, but at its heart, David Koresh's, or should I say the Davidian's uh, problem started the way so many others have started that I have done stories on. That is, somebody got angry at Koresh, a former uh, member, and made a phone call, and that phone call happened to fit in uh, when he called the uh, police agency with a political agenda that was going on. In this case, it was the Clintons are coming in, they want more gun control, and we're the guys who benefit by that, so we're going to do some big stunt. The uh, the business that uh, was emphasized on the ABC story about the uh, UPS driver uh, having a package of hand grenades open up. There wasn't a package of hand grenades. I bet you go to an Army-Navy store, surplus store in Texas. You could certainly do it here in Santa Monica until a few years ago. And they've got a box of these hand grenade hulls sitting right by the door. You can't. They're not suitable for explosives. People made them for use them for, to make little novelties, like the one that was in the store that, on the uh, I showed this, uh, on the uh, story I did. Mm-hmm. So, And I think the Davidians were making paperweights and reselling them, right? Oh, yeah, they were making all kinds of... Yeah, paperweights, you know, all, deadly all, paperweights. Yeah, paperweights, this kind of thing. It's, you've seen this thing, there's a, there's a grenade that says, take a complaint department, take you know, pull pin, stuff like that. It's they had, they had all kinds of stuff that they made money at the flea markets, and there's just nothing going on. Now, I've talked to the... We, you know, if you, people who saw the film saw Sheriff Harwell, who was the sheriff at the time. He's now deceased. But full face on camera, he's saying that we investigated all these stories, these salacious stories about David Koresh and sex and the and, and, and Department of Public Services and our Child Protective Services in Texas did as well. And there's no case there to be made with anybody else. Remember, girls in Texas can get married at 14 years old. And it used to be some states had even 12 years old. Now, you may disagree with that. Not that, that that's think. okay, just that that's the law yeah, around I'm here. Saying, yeah, Makes you wonder saying. about our, legislat- our legislators here in Texas that that's the law, yeah. but anyway. But this, but this is stuff that goes back in the 1800s and before. It, it was it's just slowly been on the books. But again, the whole issue about the, the you know, whatever, you know, sex and whatever else was going on is completely irrelevant in terms of any legitimate purpose the ATF had to be there. They are the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And so they want a warrant, they want a big public relations uh, scare, and they lie, this is the big one of the big lies, that the Davidians were dealing drugs, which they were not. Total lie. But if you're a law enforcement agency and you provide a drug connection, you get free military uh, equipment and guns and whatnot and training that you don't have to reimburse the federal government for. If, you, if it's not drug-related, you don't get it. It's part of our war on drugs. And so they did this. They got to go to uh, Fort Hood and do uh, military training. That's where they got the tanks and whatnot. And, uh, and Huey helicopters. And Huey helicopters. And, and so you have this uh, stunning shock and awe thing going on. And because the Davidians were vilified, 
to the max. So, as you have said, many people in the public uh, justify you that we can kill them. And that's, and that's the bottom line. And it's, uh, it can happen to all you have to have is the political winds change a little bit. And if you're a Southern Baptist, if you're a Presbyterian, if you're a, whatever you are, you can be vilified. And, uh, well, we all ought to be familiar with this from Orwell. It's just the two minutes hate where mm-hmm. your actual enemy, power, points at someone who doesn't have any and says, everybody hate that guy. And then and people fall for it every time, like a bunch of animals. Yeah, that's true, and that's uh, that's exactly what we're here. It's just you've got the raid, it's the power, it's the lies, it's the warrants that uh, and, and the attributes that were 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 uh, false. Uh, the, the whole business about uh, lying that uh, the government, what people ATF wasn't shooting from the helicopters. Of course they were. I've had people. I'm a big. I'm you know. Native Texan of sorts in uh, Southern, I, I, I can uh, know how to talk to the guys, and I've had them admit it. You know, you see, all you do is go walk up to the bar where the, uh, these guys are drinking, and boy, you guys went and smoked uh, that son of a bitch down there in Hector, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I didn't tell you about that. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten my I have two Texas Rangers in my family line, and, uh, and I know how it works. Uh, Texas Rangers, by the way, I should say they're, I'm talking 1800s Texas Rangers, but these are uh, the ones that, that were at Waco were the probably the most honest guys there. And they got uh, big-footed by the FBI, by the government, and they weren't happy about it. The government uh, destroyed evidence, that big white double door at the front of the, the building that the Davidians lived in has disappeared, big metal door, and there was testimony that the bullet holes were punched in from the outside, yeah. which the government's people uh, denied. Thing after thing after thing has destroyed, has been, uh, has disappeared, but we, uh, the Texas Rangers tried to say this stuff, and they couldn't do it. Now, the thing that was really interesting that McNulty found in the evidence locker was a lot of the munitions that were used uh, that, did, that were capable of starting a fire. Uh, were mislabeled as silencers and gun parts and things of this sort. And there again, you're playing on people's ignorance if you show that stuff in court, which I don't think they, I'm not sure they did, but uh, if you review the notes. But this is a uh, another thing that's very easy to uh, hornswoggle people that uh, you can hold up a, a piece of uh, metal and somebody who knows what it is recognize it's not a gun part, but you can tell somebody else it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just one thing after another. Well, and when you talk about mislabeled as silencers, you're referring to the pyrotechnic rounds that were found at all three yeah. origins of the yeah. fires. No, yeah. yeah. And this is what, the, in the, I think this is not made clear, we make it clear in the, in, in the film we did, is that the careful way the FBI prepared the building to burn, and then it filled it with CS, which is like a talcum powder. It's not a, it's not tear gas. My, uh, I've, I've been exposed to it myself at Fort uh, Edgewood Arsenal, at, uh, which was part of Aberdeen Proving Grounds uh, back in the 60s. But it's, uh, it's a fine powder, and you get the same effect once it's suspended in the air of a grain dust uh, fire or explosion. It, um, it, it just goes through. But here's the biggie, is that when it burns, it produces hydrogen cyanide. And the, all the conditions were right that day, and the testimony was, he was uh, what the commander was asked, uh, why did you decide to do the raid that day? He said, because of the weather. And then we show you what happened with the weather. You had a 30-mile-an-hour wind blowing at one corner. That's the the building is injected with CS. That's the last corner that's pulled out, so the wind is now going on, and that's the first point where we saw on the infrared video that the government had from a circling plane where there was a flame starting. Now, there were other points where pretty close to that they did, but uh, that's, and then the fire, just a fireball, that's what people describe, just goes right through the building. The people who tried to get out the back of the building were being fired on by either the FBI or the U.S. Army or the British SAS. That's the Special Air Services, their commando group who were there as well. So we had the prospect, the possibility, that British soldiers killed American people on American soil. 
And oh, and I just I, I forgot to mention one thing here that no, yeah, I knew I those guys were there, Dan, but I had no idea that there was a uh, reasonable suspicion that they had actually participated in the firefight in the backyard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, remember, all the cameras that what happened at Waco were on the front side. You sure, yeah. See what was going on the back side. But I, oh, I forgot to mention. I mean, because there's, wait, wait, wait. But I mean, we have testimony from a CIA and a former Delta Force officer that they had, that Delta Force had admitted to them, members of, of Team B had admitted to them that they were back there shooting. Uh, was there uh, anything, was there any other indication that SAS participated other than just, we know they were there? Because there were Israelis right now, there, and I think even Russian Special Forces guys came to visit for a while too, right? I uh, haven't heard about that, but uh, I have to go back. Nobody, has, nobody has admitted that during the siege. Anyway. Had to be fired. So here's where you get into word games again. The FBI said that uh, nobody on the government side fired a single shot. Okay, does that mean they fired a whole bunch of shots? Does that mean just the FBI guys didn't shoot? <laughs> it sounds like Washington. Bill Clinton wrote that line for him himself, right? Yeah, but here's here's one I, I I meant to mention this at the top. One of the reasons for this raid that I I heard and I was able to confirm afterwards was that half the Davidians were black. The public perception was there were a bunch of white rednecks. Half were black. And you have people in the ATF who have this uh, had this annual thing called a Girl Boys Roundup, where they go in the woods, drink whiskey, hand out their hunting licenses. And I had angry agents, a couple of them, say David Koresh was miscegenated. That had to be stopped. We had to do something about that. You think we're out of the uh, out of that era? Uh-uh. All right, hang on just one second. Hey guys, I got a new sponsor, Zencash, a new digital currency, but it's got the great privacy protections built in, and it's a messaging service, and you can send documents and all kinds of things. It's really great. So uh, check that out at Zencash.io. Also, buy the book The War State by my friend Mike Swanson. It's a great history of the rise of the military industrial complex after World War II. You'll really enjoy it. And check out his great investment advice at wallstreetwindow.com. And when you follow his advice, you'll want to get at least some medals. And you do that from Roberts & Roberts Brokerage, Inc. And they've been around for 40-something years. It's a great company. They charge a very low premium to get you platinum, palladium, silver, and gold, and whatever you need there. And when you buy in Bitcoin, there's no charge. That's at rrbi.co, rrbi.co for your precious metals. And get your anti-government propaganda from libertystickers.com. If you want a brand new website for 2018, expanddesigns.com slash Scott will save you 500 bucks. Well, you know, I'm looking at the news today about Donald Trump, uh, you know, talking bad about darker skinned nations, so to speak, and what have you, that's got everybody so upset. I was just thinking, I wonder if Bill Clinton had actually used the N-word himself as he was murdering the Branch Davidians. Would the liberals have cared then? And I guess the, the joke is, like you're saying, as far as they're concerned, the Branch Davidians were a bunch of neo-Nazis or something. They don't know the first thing about it. Oh, they don't God. know that half of them were black at all. Oh, and they certainly wouldn't have said, no, the cops are the ones who are the KKK, and the Davidians are the ones who are the racially progressive types. Yeah, well, you, saw the, you saw that photo on the story I did of the ATF agents with the Confederate flag. I'm about to tweet that. it right now, actually, as we're yeah. talking. But uh, that is... I've been trying to get an original of that photo for twenty over 20 years, and nobody will admit that it even exists, but there it is. It's an interesting story how I got that, but that's the... We'll All right, so now, now, now two specific questions here. Um, well, wait, one, I forgot the second one. The first one is, uh, how certain are you that the ATF fired first when they showed up that morning on uh, February the 28th, 93? Completely. All the evidence we were able to develop was that uh, talking to people and the sound and all that is that they came up and started shooting. Uh, the first things they shot were the dogs. They had the, the Davidians had a pen out front with some dogs, puppies, and whatnot, and shot, and then they blasted through the door. David Koresh came out and you heard this and said, Stop, there's women, children are here, let's talk about this, and he got shot. So Games on, and then we have the helicopters circling and firing, strafing the place from the the air. Again, that was lied about that it didn't happen, but it did. Uh, and it's just uh, one thing after another. But it just so you go back to that question: What do you do when the cops show up at your door and start shooting? You, you know, 
do you be a good citizen? Let them kill you. I mean, what? That's, that's a that's in, maybe out here in Santa Monica. That's the answer. Not in Texas, I suspect. Well, and as you said, the law in Texas is that every human has the right to defend themselves. I mean, these people are supposedly our security force. They don't have the right to murder us. No. Well, then that's we do that's have the right to defend our lives with violent force if they use unreasonable deadly force in the first place and initiate no. it. That's the law. That's not some right wing anti government take, or maybe it is, but it's because it was written into the Constitution after the Civil War here. Yeah, and that's and Dick DeGaron and the, and the other committee attorneys made that very plain. I know Dick DeGaron from my days in Houston. Good, if you ever need a defense lawyer, he's the guy you want. And, and the other one was very good too, but he made that point uh, under oath uh, at, at Congress uh, about about that. And it's a very important principle. I don't uh, I don't know how many other states would have that law anymore. A lot of that kind of thing has been taken off the books, but uh, that's the case. It certainly was. Uh, I remember hearing that about uh, my. Like I said I had two Texas Rangers up in uh, Kerrville. That's where my family used to be before they moved west to New Mexico territory. But uh, that, uh, if somebody shot uh, a sheriff or a deputy sheriff, the the question was, okay, if it was shown that the sheriff started the problem or had no legitimate cause to be uh, pulling a gun on somebody, that's, you know, that that person's going to be found not guilty by the law. Yeah, well, uh, theoretically, anyway, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I guess that the lynch mob doesn't get him before the, but that, but these things are are very very important to remember. All right, now, so I want to ask you a little bit about the siege here, real quick, too, because uh, you know one of the important things, and this may have been in the sequel, a new revelation, uh, but it may have been in the first one too, and that was that the outgoing director of the FBI, Sessions. Mm-hmm. Wanted to go and say, look, I'm the director of the FBI. I'm in charge of negotiations here. Let's work this thing out. And Bill Clinton grounded his plane and wouldn't let him go. And he still had another week or two in, in office or something like that. But he, but Bill Clinton uh, refused to let the guy go to negotiate. Is that not right? The uh, problem here is we really don't can't confirm what was going on in the White House. I've uh, Janet Reno is the person who gets the blame public for uh, in most cases, but she had only been in office for a few weeks and she only knew what was being told to her. Uh, and what I have heard is that it is and Roger Stone says this in the book that's out that it was Hillary Clinton who was the, the hard, the hard case on, on this about negotiating and getting it over and, and, uh, and going ahead and getting it off the headlines. Uh, I don't know unless some of those people, uh, talk, uh, we're not going to know. And this, of course, is, rumor-wise, is linked in with the death of... But, but overall, factually speaking, though, he was trying to go negotiate, and somebody stopped him. Yeah, I probably took, probably, I'd have to review notes, but I think it's probably true. That's the way I remember from one of those movies. I forget which one, but yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, but somebody, we just don't know, you know, provably who said what to whom inside the White House at the time, because it was just, remember, to deviate from the official story, mm-hmm. then and with some stories now, even currently, is to be a conspiracy theorist. Mm-hmm. Well, never mind that crap. It. But wait, so now it makes sense, right, that Hillary Clinton would have been going absolutely crazy because this is the first hundred days of the Bill Clinton. I mean, yep. this happened a month into his administration. It broke out. That's what um, right. So, you know, of course, she's going nuts. But so what I'm, I guess, confused about a little bit is, well, not really confused, but I'd like to know more about how why during that 51 days when the HR with the HRT driving around in tanks threatening the people and with the FBI negotiations going absolutely nowhere why would it be that even to Hillary Clinton and I know she likes killing people but why would it be even to her the idea would uh, you know end it with some kind of violent raid rather than you know what switch out the negotiating team let the Texas Rangers negotiate let the local sheriff negotiate. Somebody, we want an end to this thing, but instead of go in there and end it, how about send in the local sheriff to be the talk, to the guy to talk now. See if we can do something, and not not for you know generous reasons, but just in, wouldn't that be the smart thing to do when when you know weeks and weeks we're talking six weeks go by, right? Weeks and weeks and weeks go by of this militarist siege thing, and, all, and still, and I understand all the propaganda against them and everything at the time, but. 
It just seems like it, it doesn't make much sense, even from the Democrats' point of view, or even from the FBI's point of view, necessarily, to send in tanks and do some violent raid and end it that way, when they could have just fired Bob and Joe and brought in Dick and Tom and put them on the phone instead and see if we can do a little bit of a different thing here. You know, switch it up a little bit. Yeah, well, the Sheriff Harwell did go out there. They, they tried, but they're, they were big-footed by the FBI. There's a, there's a whole segment here where uh, uh, Sheriff Harwell went out to uh, negotiate, and the FBI came up with some scam plan where they were going to be inside an armored personnel carrier and run out and grab Gresh quickly and run in. The, the, you've got to, again, I, if, put yourself in the mindset of, you are no, if you haven't broken any legitimate laws and you're being attacked and you're being asked to send your kids out to guys on tanks who are mooning you and turning around and doing fondling their genitalia and telling them they'll be, your kids will be sick. You're going to send your kids out there? And this is part of the, you heard this in the tapes. Uh, again, this is uh, one thing after another. There's a big disconnect between the guys in the tanks, as Dick Revis points out. Which was Dick Revis is terrific, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he is too. Of, Ashes of Waco yeah. is his book. Exactly. He was, I, I think, I like the it. second guy I interviewed on this show back in 2003. Yeah, Revis, Revis has a talent for a declar- making a declarative sentence that sums it all up, that everybody can understand. Very, very good, which is why we put him in the film. Because it gets very confusing with so many things going on at the time that have that are just uh, have nothing to do there uh, with uh, what is really happening and that's uh, they're just irrelevant and that's what he he's able to cut through there but you've got the people out in the Davidians uh, listening these theological arguments about who found Jesus where and, and uh, I you know it just it makes my head hurt but that's what was going on, and I don't think that uh, if you're in the White House and you're Hillary Clinton or you're some other official, you want this thing off the uh, you know, off the TV screen because you look weak. Uh, the questions are being raised: Why why can't you end this thing? Now, the thing that supposedly uh, Janet Reno said that she was told that caused her to act was that babies were being beaten. Now, I can't think of a, another thing that would be more inflammatory than that. Babies and what an beaten. obvious load of crap, too. Oh, yeah, when David Koresh gets frustrated, he just punches babies. And the other hundred-something yeah. people in there let him, too. Yeah. I mean, give me a break. Yeah, yeah. but see, we, are, we have this, this myth, this, this, uh, this image in our culture of the Svengali that controls people. And that's the cast that's, uh, you know, the Elmer Gantry, the, you know, pick, your, you know, pick your character, that uh, goes on. Now, and, and that's one something that uh, also fits in with this that most people aren't aware of, is that the military for years and years, certainly out in San Francisco, has been doing very curious about why people follow a leader. What is leadership? And there have been all kinds of experiments done, and I know this one was studied by people at the War College, because I've been there and was talking about this, and uh, what made people follow him? What made people, why didn't they just throw up their hands and walk out? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why, and it's, it's not a soundbite. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long conversation to understand that uh, these people felt that they were uh, being attacked by the forces of what was it, evil or Armageddon or the second coming or something of that sort, which I think is certainly doesn't fit in with anything I believe, but uh, to them, that was real. That's their theology. And the guys in the FBI who were the negotiators didn't buy that uh, because that conflicted with their ideology. So then they're arguing about how many angels can sit on the head of a pen or other such things. Which is amazing, right, that the FBI agents would be you know, so myopic, I mean, the negotiators too, that they get into like whether this is correct or not, rather than Mm. just trying to see it through their enemy's eyes. And I mean, because let's be frank about it, right? Um, And say like, okay, well, wait, if you guys think that the book of Daniel says that I'm going to bring chariots of fire and death against you, I guess I probably might be sort of provoking you a bit 
by ringing your house with a bunch of tanks <laughs> and guys with guns. And maybe if, if this is your script, maybe I shouldn't be playing exactly the role you have written for me. But instead, it, they might as well have been deliberately trying to provoke. And I'm not saying I think they were, but just in a de facto sense, they were playing exactly the role that the Branch Davidians saw the evil satanic new Roman Empire playing in the end of days yeah, and all this they stuff. Played, played right theology. And there's another factor here, too, which was these agents, the FBI, the ACF guys, wanted revenge. And I remember I went to Waco and I was talking to a woman who cleaned the one of the motels out there where the agents were staying, and she said that uh, these guys were getting so angry at each other that there were, there were actually incidents of guns being pointed by ATF agents and other agents FBI, I presume, and she said, "Well, what, what, uh, what police do I call? You know?" And they, they wanted blood. They wanted, they wanted to kill him. And the, the way that this was done, I come back to that. The careful way this uh, whole uh, attack was on the day that it was done, and the way that it was done, you can see this was done by by intention to achieve the results that you got. And the big message here that uh, was being sent was, "Don't mess with us." You know, you come, you saw yeah. it. Hey, you know what? Up. Maybe maybe I'm wrong in presuming that it was just de facto. Maybe they really did want to make sure to push the thing to a head so that they would have the chance to burn the house down because it was covered in bullet holes, incoming yeah. bullet holes, well, well, in the funny. roof, yeah, that, in the that, doors, in the everything. Do you think that's possible? That that oh, was really, that oh, level oh, of premeditated, we've got to get rid of that oh, house, yeah. boys. Yeah, and that's, and that's been, that has been mentioned many times in, the, in, in testimony that the building burned because the physical evidence supported the Davidian story, not the government story. That's why that front door has disappeared. That's yep. why everything else has happened. That's why they poured that, bleach all over the crime scene as soon as the fire went out. Well, maybe not. That's, there's, you've got bodies there. It's a hot day. It's decomposition. There's, there's reason for that, but uh, it's, 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 you got to look at this. There was, it's, it's definitely used the overall overused phrase cover up, but it, uh, it, it's there. And um, we've seen how this the, the withholding of evidence to get a conviction, the, the corruption of the judge. Uh, the, don't forget the, the the government got a big black eye on this one, and it was only because the the the, the uh, jury found the Davidians not guilty of everything, really, except a minor charge that they thought they would be released because they'd been held in custody for a pending trial for uh, a year or whatever it was, and the. The prosecutors went behind closed doors with the judge and worked him over, and he imposed these uh, draconian sentences, which were totally unjustified. And again, I like I think everybody ought to put themselves in the position of uh, in a courtroom against Uncle Sam. And it's uh, this is something that most nice people, certainly those uh, housewives, are talking about in uh, Austin, could never imagine themselves being in, but all you have to have is uh, some agency that uh, wants to make a name for itself. In this case, it's people uh, see or hear guns and religion and child abuse and all this. And, Can we go yeah, back to the bleach better. thing for a second? So I thought that was yeah. really suspicious, all those pictures of the bottles of Clorox bleach there at the crime scene right after the fire. And... Uh, but you're saying that maybe they would have needed to pour bleach on corpses out there? That can't be right. Really? Well, probably not too well, it might ruin the autopsy. But I mean, you've got bleach on. I'm just saying there is a reason for it. I, I can't get inside the head of knowing why. Was there another reason? Yeah, it could be used for the reason you're you're, you're saying. But uh, when you, I guess now, it, no, I mean it's true though that I guess I don't have like I don't think I've ever seen pictures of them literally pouring it out all over the place or whatever. But I have seen just a lot of bottles of bleach on the scene. I thought that was. Yeah. <laughs> didn't seem right, you know. Is that what you do? Bring uh, bleach to a crime scene? Well, you've got, you know. Remember, these bodies were there. It's uh, they're in a hot ashes. It's uh, what was it? You know, hundred degrees or thereabouts. In the yeah, it's not like they they cared about preserving the evidence anyway. Yeah, I, yeah. 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 Well, you're not going to be able to preserve the evidence much anyway, as far as the decomposition of the mm -hmm. bodies under those conditions. Well, and they unplugged <laughs> the freezer truck and let all the corpses in there. You know, continue to yeah. decompose. Remember that one. Yeah. Uh, now, so wait a minute. Let's. Uh, we're almost out of time here, Dan, and and I really appreciate your time on the show. Um, but let's talk about the fire here and the 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 raid and the last day there. Um, well, I guess, you know, in a nutshell, 
you think it's right that they just deliberately filled the, the house with a flammable gas and then shot in these pyrotechnic rounds to destroy that evidence and kill these people? Is that what happened? Yeah, that's what it, that's what we found. That's what the evidence uh, points to. Uh, it's uh, you don't want to see it, but that's what it is. Again, I go back to the we have the aerial surveillance video that's being analyzed by uh, Dr. Allard, and that's uh, competent to do it. He, he invented the technology, and you can plainly see where the uh, injections were made and where the fire. The first uh, flame started that's uh, registered on the infrared, and then quickly it goes um, other places. But the fireball just goes right through the building, and that's what people inside said happened. And that's where you see there was a 30 mile per hour wind blowing right at that corner. That's we have an interview with the Houston fire chief on. You remember, and he's yeah. talking about how this is likening it to a pot belly stove. They rigged it up to, to be that. But you put CS in there, and that produces uh, hydrogen cyanide when it burns. Uh, that's they know that you didn't have to do that. That's that's. Uh, and hydrogen cyanide. This is what they use to kill people in the gas chambers. Yes, and that's uh, the point is made by one of the t- people in the film that in the gas chamber when that was used, they strapped people down not because they wanted to prevent them getting away. It's because cyanide causes such extreme and violent muscle contractions that uh, they don't want the people who are viewing it, the witnesses, to see that. And that you've seen some of the pictures of the, of the children and other people from the fire, they are bent over backwards. And that's one of the characteristics, we were told, of uh, cyanide poisoning. Man. And by the way, CS, as I should mention, is uh, banned in international warfare. That goes back right. to the Vietnam days. Yeah. Right, but the FBI can use it on us. And and now, so I just want to mention Delta Force again, Combat Applications Group, uh, Team B there, mm-hmm. and there's all the work done by Lee Hancock of the Dallas Morning News about their presence there as well, worth a mention. It's pretty hard to find online. I haven't been able to find it online. That's it's- interesting. You know, I tried to talk to Lee Hancock about that, and she was just violently uh, pro-FBI to me. Uh, I know, and yet she proved it anyway that they were there. She didn't prove that they were shooting, but she certainly, you know, uncovered a lot of documents and proved a lot of your case anyway. I mean, I think I agree with you about, like, it was weird her attitude for what a great job she'd done on that story, honestly. You know? Well, I thought about about going out and visiting her and tied her or trying to where she lives, and it's, uh, and she doesn't want that out, but it's, um, she she was just so negative about, uh, Mm taking the FBI's uh, story as literal and the government story side of the story that uh, I just didn't think there's any point of it. But I, uh, what we found was conflicting with many cases with what she was uh, writing about and claiming. All right. Now uh, I'm sorry. So before we wrap up here, we really got to go, but um, I mean, we got to talk about, this is the worst thing about it, even worse than killing all the people I think, or it is to me is just the level of lies and cover up yep. here and calling it a mass suicide accusing these people of pouring gasoline on their own children and setting it on fire when that's not what happened at all. And they made people believe that. And people yep. cheered for it. I remember the USA Today poll, and this may have been fudged, but I don't know. The USA Today poll had 93% of the American people approved of the tank assault, even though it yep. had led directly to the fire one way or the other. And yep. and they thought that it was fine. Those people have been so demonized. It was like that time Saddam Hussein attacked us in New York and Washington D.C. They thought, whatever, you know, that was that was the level of deceit there. And mm-hmm. um, and they still get away with it to this day. And you know the reason that this is in the news again. Well, I got a I got a conspiracy theory. I think there's a pretty good documentary coming out, or a, a TV miniseries coming out. I saw a preview for it. It made it look pretty good. And it seems to me like maybe the reason that ABC did um, their documentary about it is to sort of try to deflate from this miniseries. And I was going to ask you if you knew if maybe this miniseries was based on McNulty's script, because I know he wrote one. And last time I talked to him, he was trying to get it published and thought he was going well, I mean, pub- uh, well, he produced in, in Hollywood. And I wondered if maybe this was it. And I wonder if maybe all this new propaganda about Waco, it's not April. Why are they doing this? They're doing this maybe well, to blunt the effect of this new miniseries, you think? Well, that takes us to another one. We uh, He got nowhere with that because he's not a script writer and all that. But we, my wife and I, had uh, were going to do a film uh, in conjunction with Walper Productions and Warner Brothers. And we were 
pretty had a pretty good start when I got a death threat to not proceed. And uh, we kept on going. And then one morning, the uh, coordinator between Walper and uh, Waters didn't show up for a meeting, and they found her body in her house, stuffed in the closet with a bullet hole in the back of her head. It's a, this is 1999. It's who, I'm sorry, murder. who was it that got murdered? It, the production uh, coordinator between Walper and uh, you see at the bottom of my bio, that's one of those unsolved murders I uh, am still seeking information on. Uh, Janet, uh, right, Janet Burroughs. You know what? There and, was that the the um, video expert who also had a suspicious death. What was his name? Yes, there were. In, yes, there, uh, I can't fall behind, but yeah, there was. There were a couple of, them, and that's uh, who were. Again, uh, he was. The guy, if it's the guy I'm thinking you're talking about, he was. Uh, t- he had spent weeks and weeks and weeks working for the congressional uh, committee examining yeah. the video. Is the guy I'm thinking yeah. of? Yeah. Well, see, now, I don't want to get into people cranked up here about conspiracy stuff, but lead. On the patch by uh, one is the headline is Andrew Breitbart's death, some uncomfortable reality. Remember, Andrew Breitbart lived down the street from me here. I, I knew him well. And there were all kinds of conspiracy theories or theories, I say, ideas put out that he might have been murdered as well. He had a heart attack. Uh, this guy that you're talking about, I believe, had a heart attack as well. Uh, I don't think that uh, those were necessarily murders, but. The question is, do we have methods of doing that to make somebody, murdering somebody, and make it appear to be a heart attack, is the, uh, is true. It's and certainly worth asking the question, if not, well, you know, jumping to a conclusion. Go back to the 1975 hearings done by Frank Church in the Senate about CIA activities, and look on the Bright, Andrew Breitbart death thing there, and you'll see him holding up the, uh, the CIA assassination gun which fires a cryogenic pellet that was undetectable at the time, this is in the 70s, and causes what appears to be a heart attack, and then the pellet uh, goes away. And this was something that uh, uh, William Colby was forced to bring into the, uh, to to show, uh, because people didn't believe this kind of stuff uh, existed, but yes, it does. And I spoke with Colby a number of years ago and his son afterwards, and there's all kinds of things that I was told about uh, that relate to Colby's death uh, that revolve around th- events at Waco. Really? Yeah, because they, the government did not want to release that uh, aerial surveillance video. And the, and the copy that we had to work with was degraded. There's something people don't... If you ever get into a legal battle with a large corporation or the government, one of the techniques they do to uh, win is simply provide so much information that you can't possibly go through it. Now, in this case, this video say was a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. It was a very degraded copy. So we're not looking at the same resolution that, say, was shown to Congress. And you can see that in the film. And you can see this in the CBS 60 Minutes portion that was later done where the, uh, they brought in a guy from the British Army whose job was to spot IRA snipers using infrared technology, and he says right there, and it's right in the story that I wrote, that uh, this isn't, these aren't reflections off of the moon, Venus, or whatever. If this is some, these are guys shooting down there into the building. The oh, and there's just no question about it. I mean, even in the degraded footage, you can see the men get out of the tank and fire their weapons. It's as simple Precisely. as that. I, just on that very last point, which is really the most important point out of all of this. If you watch Waco, The Rules of Engagement, you'll see that footage. If you watch the sequel, Waco, A New Revelation, there's higher quality version of the same footage and it yeah. proves what you thought you saw the last time. And then there's the FLIR project, which McNulty also put out, which uh, my friend Will Porter has put up on YouTube. Anybody can watch it. And this is about the cover-up when Senator Danforth uh, led the whole uh, you know, pretend investigation in 1999, right. and they rigged a fake test at Fort Hood in order to ensure yeah. that it would acquit them. And, uh, yeah, which, and it's, right. the whole thing's a joke, and McNulty tore it apart in the FLIR project. So that's Waco, the Rules of Engagement, Waco, a New Revelation, and the FLIR project. And this great article, it's really an important article. I hope everyone will look at it. It's at patch.com. Yeah. It's called, Will ABC Really Tell Us What Happened at Waco in 1993? And, of course, the answer is no. That's Dan Gifford. Thanks very much for your time, Dan.
You're welcome, Scott. Really appreciate it. All right, you guys, you know me, scotthorton.org for the show, antiwar.com and the libertarianinstitute.org for things I want you to read. Buy my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. That's at foolserrand.us and amazon.com. And follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks.